Hey, welcome back everybody for the last lecture of today's session. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here once more just Nico, uh, who will tell, uh, tell us more about paleo ecology. Please, Justin. Great, thank you for uh, having me. Um, Italy looks a lot like my garage, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here though. And let me just um, share screen. I'm not sure I can hear you. Oh, well. Okay, so can you hear me now? I can hear you well. Maybe it's on Antonio's side. Okay. Okay, so I assume that others can hear me. Okay, Antonio, you can hear me? Okay. Um, and let me share my screen and... Okay. Okay, so you can see my slides. So uh, again, thank you for, for having me. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk again about uh, a bit of an overview of theoretical paleo paleoecology. Um, and I say it's a biased overview of theoretical paleoecology because I'm going to be speaking about things that I know something about, um, which I guess is a good place to start. And uh, that is with respect to reconstructing interactions in the past and using um, reconstructed systems to say something about modern systems. Um, so very briefly, I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, Merced, um, and uh, started there in 2016, um, overlapped with uh, uh, Jacopo at uh, Santa Fe Institute uh, very briefly. Um, and you can see my, my Twitter handle and, and website are there in the bottom right. Um, and so I just wanted to give uh, oh, here we go. a little bit of a layout for where I was going over the next couple of days uh, for the series of lectures that um, I'll be giving. Uh, today, I want to uh, talk more about understanding extinct ecosystems and, and why understanding extinct ecosystems is important, um, as well as how we go about reconstructing past communities with tools from ecological uh, theory. Uh, so, so my goal today is really a broad overview. I'm going to be discussing uh, work that a lot of work that other people have done, some work that I've been doing, um, and and hopefully convince you that that examining this, these extinct systems is important and relevant. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to really focus on a on a particular case study um, of of ancient Egypt uh, over the last ten thousand years or so. Uh, to understand how the unraveling of that mammalian community over 10,000 years since the end of the Pleistocene can, can tell us something about how mammalian uh, ecological systems work generally. Um, and part of that is, is also discussing some mathematical techniques, uh, generalized modeling that can be used to assess uh, the dynamics of nonlinear systems when a lot of the system is, is unknown a lot of the particulars of how organisms might be interacting with each other is unknown. And then on Thursday, um, changing gears quite a bit, um, focusing on energetic constraints at a much smaller scale um, and, and principles of ecological interactions at, at the scale of um, uh, physiology really to, to see if we can say something about very, very large scales uh, in particular macroevolutionary processes such as the um, evolution of large body size. Um, again, uh, most of this work is focusing on mammalian systems, except a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about today? <laughs> um, why is understanding extinct ecosystems important? Um, how do we go about reconstructing past communities with, with modern tools? Um, we're going to be covering a lot of ground. Um, First, I'm going to focus on just reconstructing ancient communities, and I'm going to try to follow somewhat uh, time and some some order of time from the, from uh, the earliest uh, life uh, to life as influenced by uh, the arrival of humans on the landscape. Um, so part of this again is just focusing on on reconstructing the structure of interactions. 
Uh, but also one of the one of the advantages of looking into the past that looking into the past can give us is being able to see how communities were structured and organized before and after large mass extinctions. Um, of course, one of the big open questions in our world today is how will communities respond to uh, climate change, to anthropogenic uh, disturbances? Um, and we can gain a lot of clues by looking into the past, uh, by seeing how communities responded to large disturbances that are on record. Um, I'm gonna change gears a little bit partway through the talk and think about how organisms themselves have structured the biosphere uh, and what the role of these ancient ecosystems in, sorry, uh, what the role of these ancient ecosystem engineers might've been in structuring communities. And then finally focusing on food webs in the Anthropocene. So how have humans more recently influenced the structure of interactions? Um, and I'm open to questions being thrown out during the talk, I don't know what the, um, I think you've been waiting till the end of talks and that's fine too, but I can't see my chat window. So that's the only, that's the only thing. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna belabor the point because I think uh, you've been talking about these concepts really for the last uh, few weeks, but of course, uh, species interactions, reconstructing or understanding species interactions and, food, and paleo food webs presents some unique challenges relative to understanding contemporary systems. Um, now, of course, when we're thinking about consumer resource relationships, uh, we're, we're thinking specifically about uh, the flow of biomass, right, from one species to another. Um, and there's many different ways that we can measure this uh, in, in the past. Of course, observation is not uh, currently available to us until the invention of some kind of time machine, um, but we can observe in different ways. Um, in some systems, one of the systems I'll be discussing today uh, that are very well preserved, sometimes we can find gut contents. We can actually use gut contents to reconstruct who is eating whom. Uh, ratios of stable isotopes is another way that we can look into the past and reconstruct how, the flow of biomass. And this is really, this was my entrance into science. I was, I, I worked in a stable isotope lab uh, for a large part of my PhD. And in, in those types of um, situations, we can use the chemical signature of bone and tissue uh, the ratios of different stable isotopes to track biomass flow uh, because you are what you eat except what you excrete and that's kind of the rule of stable isotope ecology and and it allows us because many state ratios of stable isotopes are, are preserved for long periods of time um, in bone sometimes fossils um, you can go into the past and, and and reconstruct just as you would for contemporary systems and another big part of this is allometry, understanding how body size dictates uh, who can eat whom in a system or who can interact with whom in various ways. Um, a lot of this is constrained by allometry. So we can use allometric principles derived from modern systems to uh, essentially constrain how we understand um, how species may have interacted in the past. And of course, once we have these networks of interactions, we can assess how structure has changed over long periods of time or not. Um, how that structure might uh, impact or, or affect uh, the resistance or resilience of a system uh, to, to disturbance um, and other aspects of dynamics that we might be able to infer. And you know, one of the benefits here is that the story has already been told, right? So we can go into contemporary systems and assess measures of, of dynamics and try to postulate what that means for how that system changes in the future. But when we look into the past, the experiment has been run. Uh, so if we say something about dynamics, so for example, we might go into a reconstructive food web and try to say something about the susceptibility of different species to extinction. Well, then we can see if that susceptibility actually results in extinction by looking forward in time. So, so we have this time, this temporal flexibility uh, that paleontology gives us in, in looking over long periods of time uh, and, and some unique challenges as well. Okay, I think I said, I'm not gonna belabor the point, but then I belabored the point. Um, Okay, let's orient ourselves. Let's uh, root ourselves in the history of life. Okay, so Earth uh, formed 4.6 billion years ago, uh, which is at the bottom of this spiral, which looks like it came from a biology textbook because it, it did. Um, and we start at the bottom of the spiral and we start moving up uh, forward in time. Uh, we have the earliest cells at about 3 billion years, but for our interests, we're really gonna start in the, in the last uh, full turn of the spiral. So we're gonna start at the Cambrian explosion. And that was about four 
uh, 500 billion, or sorry, <laughs> 500 million years ago, half a billion years ago, uh, that we can see, I think I can use my pointer. I think you can see my pointer, I, I hope. Um, so this is the Cambrian explosion. We start here, and then this last full turn of the spiral is uh, really the evolution of complex ecosystems. Uh, that's, that's the record that we have. Um, and so we're going to start in the Cambrian explosion. We're going to spend some time in the Permian uh, towards the end of the Cretaceous, which is the, the end of the reign of, of the non-avian dinosaurs. Um, after that, we're going to zip back to the Devonian, the uh, expansion of plants on, on the terrestrial landscape, which is a really interesting time that I've been thinking a little bit more about. And then uh, and then we're going to, you know, yo-yo back up towards the uh, more recent and think about how the uh, how how humans um, have have impacted systems in, in, in the more recent past. Okay. So the Cambrian explosion. So this is work, uh, really beautiful work, um, I think, uh, done by uh, Jennifer Dunn at the Santa Fe Institute. This is a PLOS biology paper published in 2008. Um, where she and a, a team of uh, paleontologists essentially um, reconstructed interactions of species in these beautifully preserved uh, shale fauna. So the Burgess shale is in Canada and that's what's pictured at the top. Um, the uh, other shale is the Xinjiang uh, fauna. I hope I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing it right. Um, in, in China dating to around the same period of time. Uh, so they were looking at two of these beautifully preserved uh, shale faunas uh, to reconstruct the interactions. Because they're so well preserved, there's a lot of information about who was eating whom in the system. Uh, from that, they could reconstruct the interactions and then see if uh, food web organization is in any way comparable uh, to contemporary systems. Um, to get a sense of the scale of this question, we really have to understand um, how alien these systems were. Okay, so I want to spend a few minutes just, just looking at the Burgess Shale. Okay, so these are, first of all, half a billion years old. Um, and I want you to notice how very well preserved they are. Uh, but then let's look at some of these species. Uh, the Micromitra uh, looks kind of like a today's, you know, urchin. Um, Wawaxia is, is somewhat uh, urchin-like. Um, hallucinogenia, just the names of some of these species illustrates how strange they are. Uh, we don't even know, uh, well, I guess more recently when they found it, they didn't know which was up or down. I think um, they have a better sense of that now. I, I still don't. Um, uh, and uh, Leoncolia. Uh, so, so these are very strange and very different looking species than uh, what we have in uh, shallow intertidal systems today. Uh, the British shale was a, sh a shallow marine uh, system. Um, oops. Here's a couple of others. Um, these, the bottom colored images are the more recent understandings of these two different species, uh, Odontogryphus and uh, Nectocaris. Uh, the above illustrations are how they were originally conceived. Um, some were better than others. Uh, it's a lot of work trying to reconstruct uh, what was what, <laughs> even in very well preserved uh, shale fauna. Now, one of the original ideas um, that uh, is, is very well described by Stephen Jay Gould uh, in his book, Beautiful Life, or sorry, Wonderful Life, uh, that, that I showed on a previous slide. Um, one, of, one of his original ideas, and it was a popular idea for a while, is that the Cambrian explosion was really this period of um, massive experimentation where these different life forms uh, had a lot more morphological disparity uh, compared to similar systems today. So you can see this middle image here is this Gould 1988, 1989 interpretation where um, the x-axis is documenting the morphological disparity of the system and time is moving from the bottom to the top. And so his idea was that, um, you know, these systems were, were experimenting with very different shapes and very different modes of, of life. Um, many of which were not successful, and those that were successful, uh, of course, gave way to, to life as we know it today. The more recent interpretation of this, however, is that there's about as much morphological disparity in the Cambrian explosion as there is today, maybe even a little less. Um, and even these very strange species that don't look like they have any modern relative 
our, um, oops. Oh, I think I skipped a slide. I was probably gonna pop up later by accident. Um, these, uh, these two very strange looking species are actually um, early mollusks. Uh, and so, so even these kind of alien looking organisms that were in the Burgess Shale uh, or in these shale faunas are related to uh, modern relatives. Um, and, and perhaps these systems aren't quite as alien as we thought. So taking advantage of this um, preservation allows uh, paleontologists to, to go back and reconstruct who was eating whom. Um, for example, uh, so, so this is a very simple illustration of the Burgess Shale food web. Uh, we can reconstruct, uh, of course, you know, the algae species and then those organisms that were specializing on, on, on grazing and, and filter feeding, um, illustrated in the, in the brighter green color. Uh, those organisms that were scavenging, uh, those organisms that were active predators. And we can get a sense of, of the actual species interactions by observing stomach contents, which I'm showing in the, the lower left here. So this is the stomach contents of, of one of the organisms in the Burgess shale fauna. We can actually see inside the soft tissues were not preserved, but left impressions in the shale. Um, feces uh, allow, um, allow us to reconstruct interactions. The bite marks can be matched to the mouth parts of, of predators. Um, and of course, uh, body size determines uh, to a large extent, uh, who is capable of eating whom in terms of active predation. So if we accumulate all of these different lines of evidence, we can, and even weight the different lines of evidence with, uh, with our ability to say something about the interaction, you know, more certain interactions or less certain interactions, uh, where we can reconstruct the food web. And this is what Jennifer Dunn and her team did. Um, so now that they're able to reconstruct the food webs of these shale faunas, uh, what's one way that we can go about uh, comparing whether you know, the structure of these uh, systems was different or similar to, to those today? Um, the way that they went about this is looking at the cumulative link distributions. Um, and so here I'm showing uh, link distributions for, let's see, one, two, three, four, five modern food webs, uh, you know, all of the all of the ones that you've probably seen over and over, Little Rock Lake, uh, Ethan Estuary, Silwood Park. Um, and one of the, and then the link distributions is illustrated below it. One of the things that you can immediately see, of course, is that these link distributions are long tailed. Uh, so we have uh, most species tending to be specialists. In other words, they have fewer trophic links to other species and relatively fewer species being uh, generalists where they're linked to many, many other species in the systems. Uh, in the system with trophic links. Um, one way that we can more vis easily compare these systems because they all differ in size and they all differ in link density um, is to divide, uh, to scale the cumulative, cumulative link distributions by the average number of links per species. And this is what I'm showing on this slide. So now we still have the cumulative distribution on the y-axis, but on the x-axis, we have the number of trophic links that, that's scaled to the average number of links per species. So we're scaling uh, the distribution to the, uh, the density of the network. And what we find is that all of the distributions fall on top of one another. So all of these different systems do seem to be constrained by or do, do, do appear to be to share uh, similar constraints in terms of the distribution of specialists and generalists, trophic specialists and trophic generalists in the system. And uh, just one thing to note that the uh, distribution tails uh, fall off much more quickly than you'd predict from uh, scale free networks. So I've just you know, put on top of this a, a power law relationship um, where, and, and, and we see these ecological systems are um, fall off very quickly um, so, so generalism um, is not following a, a scale-free um, power law uh, relationship here. Okay, so, so what? How does this uh, relate to the Cambrian system? Um, well, we can take these cumulative uh, degree distributions and of modern systems and compare them directly to the Cambrian food webs because this is, we, we have the same type of information. 
Um, what I'm showing here, uh, again, is the same x-axis and same y-axis as before, the normalized number of trophic lengths on the x-axis and the cumulative probability distribution on the y. Uh, the color um, squares are modern food webs from eight different sites. And the black and the gray circles are two Cambrian food webs, uh, one from 505 million years ago and one from 520 million years ago. And the message is pretty clear here. Um, they all fall on top of each other, which really kind of blew my mind uh, because again, these are ecosystems at the very beginning of multicellular complex life. These are some of the first ecosystems um, that we have record of assembling. Um, and to think that they share such strong structural similarity um, to modern systems, to me, is very, very striking. Uh, but it suggests that there is a, fix a fixedness to food webs, that there are similar processes constraining interactions, um, and that these processes that constrain interactions are, are truly independent of taxa, truly independent of location. Uh, I mean, this, these, this is a shallow marine system on the shores of Pangaea, uh, so of course very different than, than anything today. Um, it's independent of time. This is half a billion years ago um, and, and independent of environment. Uh, so, you know, these energetic constraints, these interaction constraints are apparently, they, they would appear to be uh, very fixed over time and space. Uh, I guess I'll let the uh, uh, animation play out here. We have a, a trilobite which uh, bit, the dust, bit the dust in the Permian. Uh, which we'll get to in a minute here. This is Anomalocaris, one of the top predators in the Bridges Shale. Um, I guess while, while this is playing, I can see if I can see the chat window. Okay, <laughs> you can see the pointer, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so because Oh yeah, uh, so so every nature uh, now it's going to replay. So every nature video has to have a predation event. That's like a, a, a law of the universe. Okay. Now let's let's move forward then um, and think about uh, communities before and after mass extinction. So we've looked back at the Cambrian. So I've 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 point I've I'm showing that here. So the Cambrian is about 500 million years ago. That's where we've been move forward for you know quite a while. Um, we don't pop up until the very end over here, but let's move forward uh, a couple hundred uh, million years. And what I'm showing on this graph is the extinction intensity. So, so Earth has been marked, Earth's life on Earth has been marked by five large extinction events. Uh, it's very likely we are creating the sixth, the most, the sixth mass extinction. Um, but one of the largest, the largest mass extinction event was at the end of the Permian. It's called the Permian Permo-Triassic mass extinction. Uh, so we're going to visit this mass extinction. How were communities structured before the mass extinction? How were they structured after the mass extinction? Can structure tell us anything about the dynamics or the robustness of the community? Um, and then we're also, we're going, we're not going to the Cretaceous mass extinction, the asteroid impact, unfortunately. Uh, but we're going to go to this event that occurred right before the asteroid impact. It's called the in Cretaceous restructuring period. Uh, now, this is when all the big famous dinosaurs were walking around the landscape. And um, what we see at, towards the end of the Cretaceous is a, a very large decline in diversity. Um, there's even a period where sauropods just disappear. They reappear later, so they didn't go extinct at that point. Um, it's, it's called the sauropod gap. Uh, so strange things were happening at the end of the Cretaceous in terms of restructuring dinosaur uh, diversity. And this was happening right before the asteroid impact sealed their fate. Um, so we're gonna visit these two big events um, in the history of life and try to understand whether you know, the changes in the structure of the food web uh, can give us any insight into the robustness of the system before or after. Oops. Okay, so again, two big events, the Permian extinction and the in Cretaceous restructuring. Let's look at this in a little more detail. So the Permian extinction, uh, this is also called the Great Dying. Uh, this was 251 million years ago. Uh, it's, you know, the causes of this are somewhat contentious. Um, some argue that there were uh, asteroid impacts. Um, it's certain that there was massive volcanism. Uh, 
uh, resulting in these, you know, one, one of the events resulted in the Siberian traps. Um, and it's thought that this massive volcanism occurring over hundreds of millions of years actually triggered a global climate change um, that uh, just altered the landscape, destroyed primary productivity, and resulted in this, uh, you know, cascade of extinctions from primary productivity to primary consumers to, to, to those consumers that are eating the primary consumers. Um, ultimately, 70% of terrestrial vertebrates went extinct at this mass extinction event, 96% of marine species went extinct. So this is, this is major, major. Um, towards the end of the Cretaceous, we have the end Cretaceous restructuring. This was about 72 million years ago. This was a little more subtle. Uh, there was a decrease in dinosaur richness. Uh, There's fewer endemic taxa. Um, and one of the big questions has always been, were in Cretaceous systems less robust due to this restructuring event? Uh, did this event set the stage for the KT extinction? Would dinosaurs have gone extinct? Uh, or non-avian dinosaurs, because of course birds are dinosaurs. Uh, would non-avian dinosaurs have gone extinct um, if this restructuring didn't happen? Did this restructuring really erode the robustness of the system so that the asteroid impact had a larger effect than it would have otherwise? Now, for both of these um, reconstructions, I should mention, by the way, this is uh, work done by uh, Rup Narayan and Mitchell. Um, they, they used a technique called guild level reconstructions where we really can't say to the species level who was eating whom. Uh, so instead, what they, went, what they did was reconstruct guild level reconstructions of who was eating whom. So the guilds here are um, you know, coded blue and then the species are coded green on the inside. So we might not be able to establish species to species interactions, but we can say with confidence based on what we know about modern systems, uh, which guilds were interacting with each other. And once we have these guild level reconstructions of the system, then we can randomize species interactions within the guilds um, and build a, uh, you know, a set of, of food webs that we can analyze that represent likely um, ser you know, interactions between species as a function of their, of their guild interactions. Okay. And the question that they uh, went about addressing uh, once they were able, once, once they reconstructed these, these guild level structures uh, from which they could simulate um, many, many different potential food webs uh, of, of species interactions. Uh, they, they focused on this question of have large perturbations impacted food web structure or function? And uh, they assessed this by looking at um, the effects of primary extinction on the structure of the system. So for example, if they go in to their simulated food webs and initiate a primary extinction, uh, would that result in a series of secondary extinctions. Um, do you remove, if you remove um, the only resource of a consumer, of course that consumer would be a secondary extinction uh, that, that is the result of the primary extinction applied to the resource. Uh, and then you can set different cutoff levels for how sensitive you think that primary extinction or, or how sensitive secondary extinction should be to primary extinctions. And um, so they, initiated a number of primary extinctions as given by this perturbation magnitude. So as they're increasing the perturbation magnitude, they're increasing the number of primary extinction, extinctions that are imposed on the system. And of course, you would always expect that the number of secondary extinctions would increase with perturbation magnitude. As you remove more species from the system, uh, more species will secondarily um, go extinct as well. Uh, and the interpretation is that systems with a higher proportion of secondary extinctions are more fragile. In other words, they're less robust. Um, and so this is the assumptions kind of going into this experiment, uh, taking, um, taking uh, food webs reconstructed before and after these large disturbances and assessing the effect of perturbations on secondary extinctions. So what do they find? Okay, so I'm showing two sets of results here, one for the Permian extinction and the bottom for the end Cretaceous restructuring. Uh, what I'm showing up top is, uh, so in this panel labeled F, again, we have perturbation magnitude on the x-axis and the number of primary, secondary extinctions on the y. 
Um, in the Permian, before the mass extinction, uh, we have this relatively tight sigmoidal relationship between the perturbation magnitude and the magnitude of secondary extinctions. So of course, as you increase the perturbation, uh, perturbation magnitude, you have an increase in the number of secondary extinctions, uh, but it's relatively um, you know, robust to the number of perturbations at the beginning. Uh, we don't have the sigmoidal increase, this, this, this really sharp increase in secondary extinctions until the perturbation magnitude is quite high. Um, in comparison, if we look at Triassic systems, again, these are systems that were reconstructed following the Permo-Triassic extinction. Uh, so, you, you know, these are recovering systems. Uh, we find something very different. We find that, uh, well, Rupnarine <laughs> et al. Uh, found that uh, regardless of the perturbation magnitude, there's many more secondary extinctions that, that you'd expect um, by removing species. And so you still have the sigmoidal relationship, uh, but the spread at lower, when the perturbation magnitude is relatively lower, is much greater in terms of the number of secondary extinctions. And this would suggest that Triassic systems are, are less robust, are more fragile uh, following uh, the Permo-Triassic extinction event. Um, similar message from the in Cretaceous restructuring, although they're plotted on top of each other here. So now, Blue is before the in Cretaceous restructuring, and red is following the in Cretaceous restructuring. And this would, and, and so what we see here is, you know, still a sigmoidal relationship. Again, this event is not nearly as dramatic as the Permo Triassic extinction event, but we have these elevated um, uh, secondary extinctions for any given um, perturbation magnitude uh, relative to how, how robust the system was before the in Cretaceous restructuring. So the message, the messages here then are, are that large perturbations appear to have left less robust communities um, and that declines in robustness may exaggerate extinction events. So it's, it's very true, or it appears to be the case, I shouldn't say it's very true, but it appears to be the case that, um, that the system took some time to recover and that the Triassic system immediately following uh, the Permo-Triassic was less robust. Um, and it's also very possible that the, the in Cretaceous restructuring really set the stage uh, for the effects of the asteroid um, when it hit the planet 66 million years ago, uh, signaling the end of non-avian dinosaurs. Some more recent work, again by Jennifer Dunn, um, focused on, follow, okay, so, so 66 million years ago, the asteroid hits the planet. Uh, non-avian dinosaurs are wiped out, and this really opens up niche space for mammals. Um, and this is, to a large extent, why we're here. Um, and one of the best uh, faunas for these early mammalian communities is 18 million years after the asteroid impact in Germany, the Messel, the Messel fauna. Um, and Jennifer Dunn and colleagues reconstructed these incredibly um, highly resolved uh, food webs, one for a lake community and one for a near shore community, um, a, a forest community that, that was nearby this lake. Uh, nearly 700 species are, are in these networks, which uh, challenges a lot of modern, uh, modern food webs, contemporary food webs, uh, using again a, a cascade of uh, different uh, lines of evidence from functional morphology, gut contents, damage patterns, body size, copper lights, etc. Um, in these really highly resolved systems. And they show that 18 million years after the asteroid impact that the structure of these systems is indistinguishable from contemporary food webs. So a very similar message as the Burgess Shale. Uh, but this suggests that even if systems are less robust following mass extinction events, as Rupnarine pointed out following the Permo-Triassic, or sorry, yeah, the Permo-Triassic um, mass extinction event, uh, after the asteroid impact, uh, given 18 million years, the system had apparently reassembled to a structure that's no different from contemporary systems. Okay. Uh, one of the, um, I think one of the most interesting things when you look back into the paleo record and reconstruction of life on earth is the role that organisms played in essentially establishing the biosphere. Um, in other words, 
the environment not only had a large impact on evolving communities, evolving communities had a large impact on the environment. One of the most dramatic examples of this, and, and, and this, is, this is via engineering, these are changes levied upon the environment by evolving species, uh, changes to the atmosphere, changes to the bedrock, um, changes to rivers. Uh, the more detail we uncover from the paleo record, the more dramatic uh, we see uh, species having an impact on abiotic, on the abiotic system. One of the most dramatic examples of this is the evolution of multicellular cyanobacteria in the oxygen crisis. Okay, so if we look back, this is atmospheric oxygen that I'm showing on this graph. Before 2.4 billion years ago, there was very little oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay, uh, 3.2 billion years ago, we have uh, ox oxygenic photosynthesis uh, beginning. Um, at around, in the most recent estimates, uh, put this almost squarely around 2.4 billion years ago, is the evolution of the first uh, multicellular cyanobacteria. Um, and immediately following the evolution of multicellular cyanobacteria and diversification of multicellular cyanobacteria, we have an explosion of oxygen into the atmosphere. And of course, this is an inference, but uh, the timing suggests that the oxygenation of the atmosphere um, is due to the evolution of multicellular cyanobacteria. So these are the first uh, global engineers, at least that we have record of, that are operating on a, on a grand scale, pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. So uh, understanding these, these feedbacks between the biotic and abiotic environment um, is, is really vital for understanding uh, the evolution of early life on our planet. And of course, understanding the future of, uh, <laughs> of our planet. Uh, we are engineering on a similarly grand scale. We are changing the climate in a much shorter period of time, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And we don't really know what the effects of this is going to be. Um, so understanding the roles of these global scale ecosystem engineers is important for understanding our role. It's also important for understanding the history of life. Um, one of the recent uh, projects that I've been involved with is trying to understand the role of engineers within complex ecological communities. Uh, so on the right, I'm showing the cyanobacteria and uh, forest ecosystems on the top. Uh, which, which I'll get to the evolution of forests in a moment. Um, in the middle here, this is a, a rock boring shipworm that was recently discovered. So it actually digests rock, but it's an ecosystem. It, it's also an ecosystem engineer on a much smaller scale. I'm paying, uh, paying tribute here to the rock eater from the never ending story uh, in, in the subset image uh, for those of you who have seen the never ending story. Um, I'm also dating myself, I get a, a little bit, but the rock boring shipworm um, uh, bores through rock in, in near streams, and it actually creates microhabitat uh, for invertebrates that live within these rocks. So it's creating habitat for other species. Uh, so it's also an ecosystem engineer on a smaller scale. And of course, elephants are, are common examples of ecosystem engineers as they move about changing the, uh, the landscape um, and opening habitat for uh, smaller grazing organisms. But what is the role of uh, engineers within complex ecological communities. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, theory developed to examine the role of ecosystem engineers and systems, uh, but most of it is within a, a smaller uh, scale. So understanding uh, maybe one or two species, how they might be impacted by, by engineers. Uh, we wanted to understand how engineers might impact a community of species. Uh, and that really required us to think about how to integrate these abiotic interactions into uh, the biotic interaction, interactions that we characterize with food webs. Um, and we wanted to really uh, zoom away from just thinking about uh, trophic interactions. We wanted to think about interactions more generally. So taking into account trophic interactions as well as mutualistic interactions. Um, and so this is a little schematic that uh, details our, our process of integrating these different aspects into, into a uh, species network uh, where we have uh, three different types of interactions. We have eat interactions, need interactions, and make interactions. And we have two different types of nodes in the network. We have species, uh, which are the colored circles, and we have modifiers, which are the black, which are the black nodes. 
the modifiers represent the abiotic changes that are introduced by species. Uh, so for example, the rock boring shipworm uh, pictured to the right uh, creates uh, opening, a porous opening in the rock. So the porous opening in the rock is the abiotic condition, is the modification that species makes to the environment that other species might rely upon. Okay, so species can eat other species, uh, species can need other species, and from these interactions, they create uh, trophic and uh, mutualistic interactions. Uh, species make modifiers, and in that case, they are ecosystem engineers. And then other species can eat or need those modifiers. Um, and, and again, the modifiers are, are somewhat abstract, so they're, they're, not they're not specifically detailing any type of modification, but a general modification that species make to the system. With these series of dependencies that species now have between each other and with the abiotic modifiers, we can then establish a, uh, an assembly process and uh, a a set of dynamics, a, a very simple set of dynamics that dictate how uh, systems are put together and change over time. Um, so on the panel D here, I'm just illustrating a very simple food web um, where we have, let's, let's just kind of walk through this here. So these are consumers that both are eating this resource. This consumer is an ecosystem engineer and it makes this modifier. This modifier, this modification to the landscape is being consumed by this species. Um, these two consumers are competing for this resource. Um, this species that my pointer is on is engaged in a mutualistic interaction with this uh, lower trophic level species, whereas the other consumer is just engaged in a trophic interaction. There's no service dependency. And now we imagine that another species is colonizing. So we have the colonization of this um, yellow species with kind of this black ring around it to indicate that it's just colonized into the system. It's colonized into the system where this consumer is eating it and the um, modifier is needed by that species. Um, the, one of the key ingredients to this assembly framework that I'm understandably uh, describing very quickly um, is that we allow uh, species to have varying numbers of trophic interactions, but they need what they need. In other words, if they lose anything that they need, any of the service interactions that they need, uh, then they go extinct. However, they won't go extinct if they have at least one thing that they eat. So in other words, you have to eat at least one thing to stay in the system, but you have to have all of the um, species or modifiers that you are engaged in service interactions with uh, to stay in the system. Um, so the assembly process then allows this colonizer to come in um, and extinction works uh, through, primary extinctions work uh, through competitive exclusion. So um, we consider the fitness gains of species that are engaged in service interactions. So species engaged in service interactions gain a fitness benefit, uh, whereas species that have multiple predators um, lose fitness because they're spending more of their time avoiding predators uh, than they are trying to fulfill their own functions of life. Uh, and species that are generalists have a fitness disadvantage relative to species that are specialists. So those rules determine which species in the system are subject for primary extinction. And so if this consumer is, uh, goes extinct, um, then we see a cascade of secondary extinctions. Um, this consumer that just colonized into the system is going to go extinct because it's losing the one thing that it eats. And this consumer is going to be subject for secondary constriction as well because it's, lo it's losing the species with which it depends on uh, with a service requirement. So it has a need interaction with this species. And if this species disappears, it loses that need interaction and it's also subject for extinction. So this, this is my uh, very quick introduction to this um, model. It sounds like there's a ton of ingredients, but it's a relatively simple um, uh, set of relationships. Okay, so what are some of the things that we found? Um, we found uh, 
as we increase the number of engineers in the system, uh, there's a nonlinear effect on primary extinction and secondary extinction frequencies within the system. Uh, and, and again, this is a measure of our, this is one measure of robustness uh, for these communities. And I'll come back in a second and relate it to you know, the fossil record. What does this have to do with the fossil record? So as we increase the number of engineers, we're also increasing the number of engineering dependencies, uh, how many species depend on those engineers. Um, and we find that when extinction, when engineers are relatively rare, so this is um, this, this one here, this is when engineers are rare, uh, we find that there are higher rates of primary extinction coupled with lower rates of secondary extinction. And that means that extinctions are more common, but they're of limited magnitude such that disturbances are relatively compartmentalized. Um, the reason for this is that there's uh, stabilization of consumers in the system because there's redundant resources uh, that, that eventually increases the vulnerability of, of prey to predators. And that's increasing the primary extinction um, frequency in this case. However, as we increase the number of engineers and with that, the number of engineering dependencies, we find that both primary extinction and secondary extinction rates decline. Uh, and this, cor this corresponds to increased persistence of species in the system. And this has to do with the expanding niche space that ecosystem engineers supply to the system. And when there's many more engineers in our systems, there's also more engineering redundancies in the system. So you have multiple species that are engineering the same modifiers. In other words, they're changing the abiotic environment in the same way. Uh, it's, it's similar to having multiple species of tree, which are pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. If we lose one species of tree, we're not losing oxygen in the atmosphere because so many other um, autotrophs are, are doing that. Um, okay, so, so there does seem to be a very important role. Um, this is again, a first pass, but uh, there does seem to be an important role of engineers in communities. How can we levy, levy that to explore uh, paleo systems? And I think I'm gonna end uh, on this note. I, I think I have till 10.15, uh, am I going up to 10.15 or? I guess you'll stop me at some point. Okay. So how could we levy this uh, ecosystem engineering community model uh, to say something about the past, to try to understand past systems? Uh, one of the um, big questions that I would like to really explore um, is, is, the, is the Devonian. Now, in the Devonian, uh, we have the uh, evolution of early land plants at the beginning of the Devonian. And at the end of the Devonian, 60 million years ago, we have forests. Okay, so um, this is called the, the Devonian plant explosion. Uh, and obviously a really important period in Earth's history. Uh, we also have another oxygen bump associated with the evolution of forests. Um, but these early tree species, these early plants that were living on the land, uh, were ecosystem engineers on massive scales. Uh, they created the soil, okay? So we have soil generation, uh, pedogenesis. Um, they began the process of weathering the soil, and this served to accumulate carbon uh, into these uh, silicate weathering products. And so it's sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, placing it into these silicate weathering products. Uh, these weathering products were being swept into the ocean and buried in marine sediments. Um, it's thought that this series of uh, events led to massive climate cooling and glaciations. And there's a large extinction at the end of the Devonian. Uh, and it's been theorized that it's tied to this plant explosion and to this initiation of these terrestrial ecosystem engineers, changing both the soil, the atmosphere, and as a consequence, uh, the marine system uh, where, where massive extinctions were then, then occurred at the end of the Devonian uh, during this uh, 60 million year interlude. And so how would we levy a model like the one that I described, uh, albeit very quickly, um, to, to explore this problem? So we could imagine, uh, and I'm illustrating this on the, on the bottom left here, uh, we, have, we have a species or a set of species that are, that are creating a modification to the environment. These might represent Cooksonia, the, early, the earliest uh, terrestrial plant that we have on record, pictured in the circle down here at the early Devonian. Um, 
over evolutionary time, uh, these plants uh, diversify into a large clade of terrestrial land plants, eventually forming these early uh, lepidodendron forests uh, that we have record of, these, these giant fern-like forests uh, towards, the, towards the late Devonian. Now, all of these forests are also contribu contributing uh, modifications to the environment. And, and so I'm, I'm drawing a link here between, and I'm just picturing a single uh, modifier here, but uh, we could imagine that it might be a set of related modifiers. Um, and now these modifications are, are impacting other species. Other species now that are colonizing these forests are depending upon uh, the modifications that these ecosystem engineers are making. And perhaps there's also direct exclusion of other species. So whereas some species may be depending on the modifications that ecosystem engineers are making, other species are being excluded from those environments. And exclusion is one thing that we haven't really investigated with this initial model of ecosystem uh, engineering within a community context, but I think it's gonna be a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, okay, can somebody tell me how much time that I have? I think I, think I should probably just stop here. Uh, the next, kind of the next place I'm going, and this is gonna feed well into what I'm talking about tomorrow, uh, is the effects of humans on ecosystems. And I can just begin uh, tomorrow uh, here. That's great. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we have uh, several questions in the chat. You can uh, read them out or you can invite directly the persons who ask the questions to speak for themselves. Okay, so I'll go back. Okay, so here's an earlier question. Um, what's the reason or the theoretical argument behind this universal law of trophic links? Is it dependent, is it independent of average biomass per individuals? Uh, because it's, so here's my answer. Uh, here's my guess anyway. Because it, it seems to be um, independent of system, it, it seems to not be system specific. It's a general uh, relationship that spans space and communities and types of communities and types of systems. Um, it, it would seem to be relatively universal um, or at least it hints at some universality. Uh, and then I would say it would likely be independent of average biomass per individuals because I would, um, unless that also might be uh, relatively consistent. Although, um, you know, there's strong allometric relationships between uh, the amount of biomass per individual in a system that also uh, changes quite a bit from one system to another, a mammalian system. Uh, the, in mammalian systems, we have Damoth's law. Um, in ectothermic systems, uh, well, Damoth's law corresponds to ectothermic systems as well. Uh, this might be one of the things that could be structuring um, some of those larger scale uh, uh, interaction uh, patterns that we see. Um, I don't think it's uh, full. I think this is, I think this is an open question. Um, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for um, why trophic links would be structured in that way. Um, you know, one of the things that we've thought about exploring is, and we, we kind of get to this in our, in our ecosystem engineering model, is that, um, you know, specialists tend to have um, short-term fitness benefits. Um, specialists tend to be better at capturing their prey because they have adaptations uh, to capture specific prey. However, over long periods of time, over large perturbations of events, uh, generalists tend to have an advantage uh, because they can adapt when things go bad. Um, and so this, this ratcheting between generalism and specialism uh, may very well lead to the types of patterns that we see in the link interaction distributions. Uh, if we have the survival of generalists after a mass extinction, uh, like we see at the KT, uh, when the asteroid impact hits, you know, when the asteroid hit, hit, hits the earth, um, the organisms that, small, or, 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 that survive are small generalist mammals. Uh, and small gen generalist organisms, um, regardless of whether they're mammals or not. Um, and 
so if it's if you have survival of these generalists after these mass catastrophes, uh, but then selection towards specialization uh, over shorter periods of time, uh, that very well might might explain some of that. Okay, um, what are guild level reconstructions, or specifically what are guilds? So guilds are organisms that share uh, similar foods. Uh, so I might put pollen eating bats, pollen eating birds. Uh, into pollen eating insects into, uh, into the same guild. Um, so they may be not closely related to each other phylogenetically, but they share similar resources. And so the idea of reconstructing guilds is just finding organisms that, um, that, that share the same types of foods. And that's all inferred, by the way, that's just inferred from uh, paleo reconstruction, uh, body size constraint, um, you know, do you have sharp teeth? Are you a carnivore? Or uh, are, are you obviously an herbivore uh, because of the shape of your teeth? So there's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of, um, not guessing, but I would say um, there's a lot of different lines of evidence that go into that, some of, some of which might be good evidence and some of it might be somewhat shaky. Uh, so we have to be really careful about, you know, what we're assigning, um, what we're assigning and how certain we are of it. Uh, so I'm just kind of going down the list. It would be great if you can share some references on any, mathema any mathematical models about this topic. Um, I, I assume you mean with respect to reconstructing uh, food webs. You know, I haven't talked yet about dynamics in terms of, of building ODEs. I'm gonna talk about that a lot more tomorrow. Uh, so far, is this true? So far, I've, I've only really been uh, talking about structural dynamics, uh, so not imposing um, change, change in biomass over time or change in populations over time, but I will tomorrow for sure. Uh, do trophic, yeah, do trophic network summary features vary before and after large disturbances? Um, there are some structural differences uh, in the uh, permio, permo-triassic food webs uh, that I was discussing. So before the, the large extinction event at the uh, permo-triassic boundary, um, I don't, I don't have those in my brain at the moment, <laughs> but they're in the root neurine paper. Um, so just cut me off when I run out of time. <laughs> is uh, cell network theory, which is introduced? You know, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that theory. So I would I would be interested in uh, is is that something that was discussed uh, during during this class? Well, that would be interesting. I, I'd, I'd be interested in learning more about it. Um, great. Yeah, so, so if there's time for any other questions, I'm happy to, to do my best to answer them. Yeah, let's see if there's anyone who wants to ask a question. They can raise their hand also and speak on the mic. I don't see any of those. Okay, so if that's the case, thank you very much, Justin, for this introductory lecture, and we're looking forward to hear more about this in the following days. Sounds wonderful. Thanks for having me, and I'll I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow, and bye, bye everybody. Bye.